My name is Lauren Gardner. I'm an associate professor at the Civil and Systems De uh, Engineering Department at Johns Hopkins University. I'm leading the efforts behind the COVID dashboard that most of you are probably aware of. Uh, so I just am here to talk through a little bit about how this dashboard works, the features of it, and a bit about the data collection process behind it and some of the user uh, stats as well. Um, so what we're doing is we're clearly, we're tracking total cumulative confirmed cases of COVID all around the world. And we have here in this now global view, um, the red circles represent the total number of reported confirmed cases to date by region. And the region, uh, the spatial resolution of the regions that we're reporting on differs de uh, depending on where, where we are in the world. So for instance, in China, we're reporting at the province level, at the US, at the county level, Australia and Canada at the city level, and the rest of the world at the country level for right now. Over here on the left is a list of all the countries. And on the right is the deaths and recovered, which is, we're also reporting. And you can see the actual numbers by region. Um, you can click on a location and it zooms into it on the map. And it, you also here can highlight the specific stats for that region. And then you can switch tabs here and you can see at the finer spatial resolution for that location. Another thing that we're highlighting is in addition to the total confirmed cases is the number of active cases at any point in time. And so this is the total number of cumulative confirmed cases minus the recovered minus the deaths. And so this is really important because it kind of represents the more or better reflects the risk at any point in time. And I think what we'll see over the next few months is a shift of these kind of active cases from east to west. Um, on the bottom right, we have a little timeline of the kind of temporal nature of this outbreak. And so here we're tracking the total cases over time, the total recovered over time, and the cases are broken down into cases within China and within mainland China and outside of China. You can switch tabs over here and see it at the logarithmic scale. So we can kind of capture the exponential nature of the outbreak that we see at early stages. And then also we can... Um, track it at a daily scale in terms of the number of new cases or newly recovered cases reported on a daily basis. And you can kind of turn these off and on so you can see just one series. And what we're looking to do soon is uh, disaggregate this red bar chart into and split it between new daily cases in mainland China and outside of mainland China. because. We've recently passed the point at which case we now have more cases outside China than inside China on a daily basis, which I think is a pretty critical shift in this, in this situation. Um, and then on the bottom here is a text box with a whole bunch of really important stuff that I think nobody reads. And it includes a link to the Lancet Infectious Disease article that, or letter that we wrote, which um, details the data collection protocol behind this and what the data sources are. Uh, there's a link to a mobile app and the, a link here to um, our blog, which details background about both the outbreak, the mapping efforts, and also some other modeling efforts that we're doing behind the scenes. Um, and then a bit more about the data sources and some of the details about the map. And so, as I said, this is all actually hosted out of the school uh, Whiting School of Engineering at, at Johns Hopkins. And so one thing about where this data is coming from, in two minutes I cannot explain the details of the process behind this data collection, but what I can say is that it uh, spans the entire scope of pure manual data input to purely automated data input, depending on the source, and also some combination of both. And so, for example, China data is completely automated and has been since February 1st, and is pulled from a particular website and updated every 15 minutes. At the moment, the US data entry is completely manual, and then the rest of the world is some combination between these two. Where the data is coming from is a variety of sources, and in general, it's based on 
daily, it starts with the daily reports from WHO and the National Health Commission of the People's Republic of China, but those only come out every 24 hours. And though, so we use those kind of as a baseline, and then throughout the day we supplement with um, local level, city level reporting and reputable news and media outlets and local health departments as new cases come available. Because obviously these are coming out at the city level first, so they're not able to be incorporated into these national level reporting um, reports that only come out on a daily basis or less frequent. And, and so to kind of instill confidence and validate this data, what we're doing behind the scenes is we're consistently comparing our data on the dashboard with the data provided by those WHO reports. And so that's what's shown in these two maps on the left. And so what we can see is that at any given point in time, we're always presenting more cases, as you would expect, because we have the cases that have at least always been reported previously by WHO, plus whatever the new cases are at the time. But what you can also see is that they follow the same trend. And, and so we are consistently reporting the, the uh, reliable and I think accurate data. There are a few discrepancies, for instance, on the bottom when Hubei province changed their reporting criteria and started reporting clinically diagnosed cases. There was a huge jump of about 15,000 cases reported that day. We captured it at the time. WHO captured it a few days later. Um, and then on the right, on the bottom, is something that I think is really important and critical about this dashboard is it shows its ability to let the public know when a new region becomes affected. And it does this in a really timely matter. And so what that shows is on the bottom is the countries that are reported in the WHO situation reports and the date they're reported on. On the top is when we include the countries in our dashboard. Blue means we did it before the WHO report came out and red means we missed it. And you can see that we almost always report countries on the dashboard before they're formally reported in the WHO reports with only a couple exceptions. And those exceptions happened in the first week of the dashboard when everything was done manually. And one of them was uh, early Saturday morning when my PhD student was sleeping, I think. Um, so we're doing a really good job, I think, of keeping tabs of when new important events are happening, and then we can see that the data that we are presenting is accurate and aligned with the official reports that are coming out, even though we're providing it and collecting it in an independent manner. And this is all provided in the Lancet Infectious Disease Letter. Um, and then a little bit about the user statistics. Um, this has been really a bit of a shock. Um, this is a curve of the daily request. So this is not necessarily eyeballs, it's interactions with the dashboard on a daily basis. And we can see that it's been pretty popular for a while. And at the moment we're getting well over a billion requests per day um, or interactions with this dashboard on a daily basis. And a couple peaks happen, for instance, around late January when Italy uh, first reported its first case. Then there was another peak around the time that there was a lot of spread within the EU and around the Middle East, and then more recently with the US local transmission. Um, and so what this is, is this is showing where this usage is coming from geographically, and it lists the top 10 countries using the dashboard, with the US being the, um, the one with the highest usage. And then the green is the rest of the countries aggregated together. So in terms of who is using this dashboard, um, as far as I can tell, it's, it's pretty much everybody. It's everyone on the, in terms of general public has really been um, the predominant users of this. And it's gone viral on almost every social media um, channel that exists, um, all the way up to our you know, local state and federal governments, uh, public health entities, and pretty much everything in between. And so I think that this really speaks to this huge demand for reliable, trustworthy, objective information, especially around situations like these. And so I think it's really important to kind of acknowledge this gap and support these kind of data procurement and data visualization tools moving forward that are to be made publicly available because this is clearly something that um, was missing and needs to exist moving forward. Um, and so lastly, this is 
definitely not something that I have done or could do or would ever do on my own. And all the other people that are part of this team really deserve all the credit for the work that's being done, uh, especially the two guys on the right. This is Frank and Hong Gru, who are two of my PhD students. And Frank has really been the pioneer behind this and led the efforts behind the actual building out of this dashboard. And these two have worked tirelessly to keep this running. And, and we also have some other really great support out of the Center for System Science and Engineering, which is uh, the, my center and where this whole effort is being led out of. And then we've had wonderful support from Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab and also Esri, who's the technology that we're actually using to build this dashboard. And this whole thing has been um, internally supported through Johns Hopkins University as well.